The steroid era of baseball took place from the late 1980s through the early 2000s, where home runs increased to record levels. The sudden spike was due to PEDs, or performance enhancing drugs. Steroid testing did not begin until 2003. In 1998, Mark McGuire hit 70 home runs to set the MLB mark. And just three years later, Barry Bonds hit 73. Bonds would go on to hit 762 for his career and rack up seven MVP awards, both MLB records. These achievements would become tainted in the years that followed. In a time where guys were hitting 50, 60, and 70 home runs a season, many players were overlooked, including when they eventually made it to the Hall of Fame ballot. This video will highlight some of the most underappreciated hitters that played during the steroid era. Make sure to leave a comment if there are any players that I did not discuss today, because there are plenty of others deserving to be in this conversation. As always, if you enjoy, make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing. Make sure to follow me on Instagram at cam 23 underscore YT and hit the bell to enable all notifications so you don't miss any future cam 23 videos. Carlos Delgado was an incredible offensive first baseman with the Blue Jays, Mets, and Marlins for 17 big league seasons. From 1996 to 2008, Delgado averaged 35 home runs a year and never hit below 24 in a single season. His incredible consistency is also tied to his ability to stay on the field. He averaged 148 games a year during that span. Delgado's best season came in 2000 when he hit 41 home runs, drove in 137 runs, and led the league in doubles, games played, and total bases. Many of his career highs came in 2000, such as a 344 average and a 181 OPS plus, meaning he was 81% better than the league average hitter. He finished fourth in the batting title race and tied for fourth in the league for homers. He made his first all-star team, won his second and silver slugger and placed fourth in MVP voting. In 2001, Delgado became the fourth player to have multiple three homer games in the same month. In 2003, he made history by hitting four homers in a single game. He is still one of only 18 players to accomplish this feat. Even more impressive is that he's the only player to do so with just four plate appearances. Delgado made his second and final All-Star game in 2003 and would go on to slug 30 or more home runs in four of his six final seasons. He hit 473 in his career, the most by any Puerto Rican-born player. When you look at all facets of Delgado's game, you start to see commonalities between him and another player who is already enshrined in Cooperstown, David Ortiz. Delgado's rate at hitting home runs is slightly above Big Poppy. In nearly 1,400 less at-bats, Delgado is also comparable in terms of triple slash numbers, and their OPS Plus is separated by just three points. Delgado was on the Hall of Fame ballot for one year and only garnered 3.8% of the votes. Jim Tomey is one of the most consistent power hitters in the history of baseball. In Tomey's peak from 1996 to 2004, a nine-year stretch, he batted 285, averaged 41 dingers a year, and posted a 157 OPS+. He hit 40 or more home runs in four consecutive seasons from 2001 to 2004, yet made the All-Star team just once in that stretch. Jim Tomey's 2002 was possibly his best offensively. 52 homers, 118 RBIs, and a 304 batting average. He led the league in walks, slugging, OPS, and OPS Plus. He was 97% better than the league average hitter in 2002, yet he finished 7th in MVP voting. The Indians finishing 3rd in the Central Division didn't help his cause. The highest Tomey ever finished in MVP voting was 4th in 2003. During Tomey's Cleveland tenure, he was teammates with Manny Ramirez, a known PED user. Ramirez was the flashier player and even outmatched his offensive production in a handful of years. Tomey also had Albert Bell as a teammate from 1991 to 1996, whose volatile personality drew a lot of attention. Both Ramirez and Bell were partially responsible for the spotlight being taken from Tomey. Jim Tomey finished his career with 612 home runs, the eighth most on the all-time leaderboard. He is three ahead of Sammy Sosa and 29 ahead of Mark McGuire, both of whom had some assistance, shall we say. Tomey is 28th in career RBIs and is tied with Edgar Martinez, Willie McCovey, and Willie Stargell with a career 147 OPS+. Some fun facts about Tomey are that he hit the longest home run in progressive field history at 511 feet and holds the MLB record with 13 walk-off home runs. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2018. Tomey was incredibly underappreciated throughout his career. One of his former teammates also made this list, and we'll talk about him later on. Jim Edmonds is often remembered for one of the greatest defensive plays this game has ever seen out in center field. 
This play, while legendary, does not do him justice for how consistently great he was in the field. He was an eight-time Gold Glove winner and won six of those in consecutive seasons from 2000 to 2005 with the Cardinals. During this same stretch offensively, Edmonds averaged 35 homers and 98 RBIs a year, while hitting 292 with a 154 OPS+. Those are amazing numbers, but Edmonds never placed higher than fourth in MVP voting. Edmonds combined his elite hitting and fielding into an otherworldly season in 2004. He had 301 with 42 homers, 111 RBIs, a 418 on base percentage, 1061 OPS, and a 171 OPS+. In a year where he didn't make the All-Star team, he set career highs in total war, home runs, RBIs, slugging, OPS, and OPS+. This would have been an MVP caliber season in most years, but when you play in the same league as Barry Bonds, in the midst of winning seven MVP awards, good luck trying to get the recognition you deserve. Edmonds wasn't even the most valuable on his own team, being overshadowed by both Albert Pujols and Scott Rowland, both Hall of Famers. For his career, Edmonds tallied 1,949 hits, 393 home runs, a 284 batting average, and a 132 OPS+. While not a Hall of Fame player yet, I believe Edmonds is a guy who could definitely get in via the era committees, which are comprised of Hall of Fame members, baseball executives, and media members. They have the authority to vote in players that are no longer eligible for election by the Baseball Writers Association of America. The next player was a teammate of Delgado's from 1993 to 1996. John Olerud had a career that far exceeds the small amount of accolades he received. With the World Series winning Blue Jays in 1993, he had the best season of his career. He tallied 200 hits, 54 doubles, 24 homers, 107 RBIs, and won his lone batting title, hitting 363. Olerud also led the league in doubles, on base percentage, OPS, and OPS+. He set many career highs and made his first All-Star team this season. He placed third in MVP voting, the highest of his career. From 1993 to 2002, he averaged a 307 batting average with a 137 OPS+. However, he made just two All-Star teams during this span. While in the Mets in 1998, Olerud nearly won his second batting title, finishing nine points behind Larry Walker. As a first baseman, he was also a great defender, collecting three gold gloves in a four-year span from 2000 to 2003. Olerud was overlooked for a variety of reasons. Two of the more pressing ones are because he didn't hit for high power numbers at the first base position, and the biggest juicers of the era were light years ahead of him in home runs. Players like Jason Giambi, Mark McGuire, and Rafael Palmero were hitting 40, 50, 60, and even 70 dingers in a single season. John Olerud, on the other hand, never hit more than 24. His strong suit was an ability to hit for average and avoid striking out. For his career, he walked 259 more times than he struck out. Olerud accumulated a 58.2 war, 2,239 hits, a 295 batting average, and a 129 OPS+. He made just two all-star teams during his career. Olerud is in a similar position as Jim Edmonds. They both could wind up in Cooperstown because of the era committees, but only time will tell. Fred McGriff, aka Crime Dog, has a case to be considered the most underrated on this list. While he never hit 40 homers in a single season, he consistently hovered around 30 a year during his 19-year career. He had 30 home runs or more in seven consecutive seasons from 1988 to 1994 and averaged 31 homers during a 15-year span from 1988 to 2002. From 1989 to 1993, McGriff regularly finished in the top 10 for MVP voting. He led the league in home runs twice in that span, yet made the All-Star team once. As a first baseman, McGriff was in the shadows of another American League first baseman, Mark McGuire. McGuire and McGriff are the same age, so from 1988 to 1991, ages 24 to 27, Fred was actually the more prolific power hitter. McGriff out-homered McGuire and was superior in just about every stat except for a marginal difference in RBIs. McGriff had possibly the best season of his career in 1989. He led the league with 36 home runs and also topped the league in OPS and OPS+. He finished sixth in MVP voting, won his first Silver Slugger, but did not make the All-Star team. This became a common theme from 88 to 91. For being a popularity contest at times, the All-Star Game has a much greater influence on a person's perception of a ball player's all-around ability. Mark made the All-Star team all four years, while Fred didn't make the team once. The Bash Bros duo of Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco, coupled with the Oakland Athletic success, led to players such as Fred McGriff being underappreciated. 
the A's made the World Series in three consecutive seasons from 1988 to 1990. In Fred McGriff's second to last season with the Blue Jays in 1989, they were eliminated by none other than the Athletics in the Championship Series. Even when McGriff changed to the National League by joining the Padres in 1992, he didn't escape the competition at first base. Now, he had to compete with Jeff Bagwell. From 1991 to 1996, while playing for the Padres and Braves, McGriff far exceeded his home run total. There's no doubt that Bagwell was the more well-rounded hitter, but it's interesting to compare their power numbers during that six-year stretch. Fred was still an excellent hitter in the late 90s, but when McGuire and Sosa were hitting 60 and 70 homers, no one was clamoring to celebrate McGriff's excellent 1999 season. Fred McGriff quietly hit 493 home runs during his 19-year career. Reaching 500 is an automatic Hall of Fame induction, but it took until this year, in 2023, for him to be inducted by the ERA committees. Eventually, the voters came around, and the stats back his case well. He accumulated a 52.6 war, collected 2,490 hits, and a career 134 OPS+. In a comparable amount of games, McGriff is just two points below Ken Griffey Jr.'s career OPS+. McGriff was the real deal. Jeff Kent was teammates with Barry Bonds his entire six-year tenure with the San Francisco Giants. He was a standout second baseman, but largely played second fiddle to Bonds. From 1997 to 2002, Jeff Kent averaged 29 homers and 115 RBIs, with a 297 batting average and a 136 OPS+. Bonds in this same stretch averaged 46 homers and 110 RBIs, with a 310 batting average and a 203 OPS+. You can start to see why Kent was overshadowed. Barry was better in nearly every offensive category. They also had an ongoing beef while they were teammates. So when Kent was able to one-up Bonds by winning his lone MVP award in 2000, I'm sure that gave him some bragging rights. That is, until Barry went on to win four consecutive MVP awards from 2001 to 2004. But getting back to the point, Kent's 2000 season was truly extraordinary. As a second baseman, he hit 33 homers, drove in 125, batted 334, and posted a 162 OPS+. He made his second All-Star team and won his first Silver Slugger award. Kent followed his MVP campaign with two more great seasons before leaving the Giants in free agency. He was a consistently great hitter for the rest of his big league career, including time spent with the Astros and Dodgers. He finished his career with a 55.5 war, 377 home runs, 1,518 RBIs, 2,461 hits, a 290 average, and a 123 OPS+. He won four Silver Sluggers and made five All-Star appearances. He is the all-time second base home run leader, hitting 351 of his 377 home runs at the position. Among players who spent 50% of their career at second base, Robinson Cano is the next closest, with 335 home runs. In his 10th and final year on the Hall of Fame ballot, Jeff Kent received just 46.5% of the votes. Andres Galarraga was nicknamed Big Cat for his cat-like quickness despite being a bigger guy. His breakout season came in 1988 with the Expos. He led the league in hits, doubles, and total bases. He made his first All-Star team, won his first Silver Slugger, and finished 7th in MVP voting. A weakness was his high strikeout numbers, leading the league in this category for three consecutive seasons. Galarraga had a few down years before he turned things around with the Rockies in 1993. He went on to have a very successful five-year run in Colorado. He made two All-Star teams and received MVP votes in every season. 1996 to 1998 was Galarraga's best three-year run of his career. From ages 35 to 37, he averaged 44 homers, 137 RBIs, a 309 batting average, and a 138 OPS plus during this span. He didn't just hit home runs, he collected 190 hits or more in back-to-back -back seasons in 1996 and 1997. In these two years, he drove in a combined 290 runs. Galarraga never finished above 6th in MVP voting throughout his career. During his Rockies tenure, he was a part of a group known as the Blake Street Bombers that included Galarraga, Larry Walker, Dante Bichette, Vinny Castilla, and Ellis Burks. All Rockies teammates at one time, these sluggers were hitting 30 plus homers a season. With all those power hitters, Galarraga was not even seen as the most prolific on his own team. In 1999, his baseball career was put on hold when he was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Luckily, Galarraga fought and was able to beat it, returning in 2000 for his age 39 season. 
He made the All-Star team and was named the National League Comeback Player of the Year. From age 40 on, he wasn't able to play as frequently, and in 2004, the cancer returned. He was luckily able to overcome it a second time and played minimally in 2004 before deciding to retire in 2005. For his career, Galarraga finished just one homer shy of 400, drove in 1,425 runs, tallied 2,333 hits, a 288 batting average, and a 119 OPS+. He might not be a Hall of Fame player, but he certainly was phenomenal during his prime. Overcoming cancer during his career and returning to all-star form the following year is inspiring. Having just brought up Ellis Burks, I think he's worthy to be in this discussion as well. Before Colorado, he was with the Red Sox from 1987 to 1992 and put together some solid all-around seasons. He won the Gold Glove and Silver Slugger Awards in 1990, made his first All-Star appearance and placed 13th in MVP voting. From 1996 to 2002, Burks averaged 30 homers and drove in 92 runs while being 38% better than league average offensively according to OPS+. 1996 was his greatest season, posting a 7.9 war with 40 homers, 128 ribbies, 211 hits, 32 stolen bases, and a league-leading 142 runs scored. Burks became a member of the 30 homer, 30 steals club. There may not be a more underrated member. He made the all-star team and won a silver slugger. He placed third in MVP voting, in which Ken Caminiti took home the award, a player who had since admitted to taking PEDs during this season. For his career, Ellis Burks nearly accumulated a 50 war, batted 291, hit 352 homers, drove in 1,206 runs, stole 181 bases, and posted a 126 OPS+. He made two all-star teams, won two silver sluggers, and a gold glove. Kenny Lofton, much like Jim Tomey, was overshadowed by Manny Ramirez and Albert Bell. However, Lofton and Tomey could not be more different in terms of their skill set. Lofton led the league in stolen bases during each of his first five full seasons in the major leagues. He averaged 65 a year and reached a career-high 75 steals in 1996. He was also a hitting machine and an incredible defensive center fielder. He won four consecutive Gold Glove awards from 1993 to 1996. 1994 was his greatest season, in which he played just 112 games due to the player strike. He led the league with 160 hits and a 7.2 war. He stole a league-leading 60 bases and batted a career-high 349. He made his first All-Star team, won his second Gold Glove, and placed fourth in MVP voting, the highest of his career. The one thing that Lofton didn't do was hit home runs. He hit just 130 of them during his 17 years in the big leagues. During his peak from 1992 to 1999, Kenny averaged just eight homers a season. With teammates Manny Ramirez, Albert Bell, and Jim Tomey hitting 30, 40, and even 50 homers a season, Lofton was overshadowed. For Lofton's career, he totaled a 68.4 war, batted 299, tallied 2,428 hits, 622 stolen bases, won four gold gloves, and made six all-star teams. He certainly deserves to be strongly considered for a Cooperstown induction. As I mentioned earlier, there are so many other players that were overlooked during the steroid era. Make sure to comment below some other underappreciated hitters during this time. If you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Later.